Greetings from Singapore. Uh, good morning. And this is actually early afternoon in Singapore. It's about one o'clock now here. Okay, so today I will be talking about data analytics basically. So I gave a slightly fancier uh, subtitle for it, Bridging Technology and Business. So that really is true. Today I'll be talking not so much about the technical details of data analytics, not the algorithms, not the, the workflow, etc. It'll be more about how it is applied in technology. Also, why it became so um, prominent these days and uh, its origin, its provenance, and also where it is heading. So it's a, like a uh, like a high level over, overview kind of talk. So if you're here expecting something like a technical research kind of presentation, you'll be a little disappointed. But those of you who are not really uh, data scientists or computer scientists, but the, somebody who is looking for some kind of introduction to data analytics, and uh, um, uh, large or, or wide ranging overview of the subject, then you will probably be happy. So let's get started. So the agenda today, I'll be talking about the changing data landscape. That's a fancy name to say that I will be looking at why data analytics is becoming so important, so crucial for businesses these days, and also where the data is coming from and why is there so much and where it's heading, what, what's its uh, prognosis. So that's the kind of uh, outlook that we'll take in the first part of the, the talk. Then we will move on to data analytics, which is of course a way of uh, generating insights from data, not just generating insights, but automatic, automatically generating insights, meaning it's something that is deployed somewhere unattended and then it starts generating insights and maybe even taking actions. That is the way it is being used in technology. And that is a very powerful mode of operation. Then after that, I'll get slightly technical. Technical in a sense, I'll start describing different ways of uh, doing things. This is more again from the business perspective so that if you are a, a systems analyst or a, or a business analyst in a, in a firm, are you looking for a particular uh, tool to solve a problem that you have, then you will have a catalog of different things that you can uh, look for. So this from that perspective, not don't expect something that is too technical even here, even though I might use some technical terms here and there. OK, so I will be talking about supervised algorithms and unsupervised and I'll kind of touch upon what clustering means, what classification means and when you use these things and what regressions are, etc. Then I will be talking about text analytics uh, a little bit, but from the viewpoint that it is uh, big data. It is actually a very information dense kind of situation. In that sense, it's uh, big data. There's big information coming out of it and it's probably not fully exploited or utilized yet. So there are avenues that you can explore in that space that might bring in business value and also technical ex excellence too. So that's the perspective I'll be taking about text analytics. Now, big data, the, the conventional definition of big data is that the size of the data is so much so big that you cannot load into the memory of one computer. So distributed compute, computing is indicated. OK, so that is about the agenda. Moving on, uh, let me tell you a little bit about who and uh, what I am. As they mentioned, I'm an associate professor of information systems at uh, SMU, that is Singapore Management University. I am on the education track, which means I am in the business of sharing knowledge. So my focus is uh, more on teaching. I've been uh, uh, an associate professor only for about four years now. Before that, I was uh, a banker. Actually, I was a quantitative finance professional working with Standard Chartered Bank on the front office trading systems and uh, taking care of their online uh, trading systems, making sure that uh, their private trading systems have the right uh, models, pricing models. So it's basically mathematical finance that I was doing there. Later on, I moved on to the risk management reporting side from the IT perspective. OK, so that's my background in banking there. I think I was there for about six years or so. But my banking career actually started with a bank called OCBC Bank, which is a regional bank, Southeast Asian Bank. Uh, that must have been about 12 or 13 years ago now. I was actually heading their risk management analytics group. There is a group called analytics, but that's not really data analytics as we are talking about now. This is more about mathematical finances, quantitative finance. So I had four or five mathematicians working for me at that point. And we were looking at uh, different uh, uh, categories of risk models uh, in their trading systems and also managing their credit risk, et cetera, et cetera. 
okay so that was my my banking career that is in red so i have different uh, uh, colors for different phases of my life so before that in green i was a research scientist working for something called a star a star agency for science technology and research in singapore so there's a government agency they have um, several research laboratories around singapore and i was a lead scientist in one of them before that i was actually doing pure research in physics so i was working at cern which you must know this is a, the place where they do Higgs boson and uh, Large Hadron Collider, stuff like that. That's in Geneva. I was employed by the French body called CNRS. CNRS, that is a National Center for Research, Scientific Research in France. So I was a staff scientist for uh, the French government working at CERN. So that was my physics career, which started with a PhD in physics from uh, Syracuse University, which is uh, what they call upstate New York. And that was uh, quite a while ago. And that's one nice picture of the music hall in uh, Syracuse University there. So that is in purple. Before that, I was an engineer. So my undergraduate degree was from IIT Madras. All right, so this is my progression. I started as an engineer, then I turned into a physicist, then came to Singapore as an applied researcher some 22 years ago. Then I quit that and wanted to make some real money as a banker. So I did that for some time. And then I kind of retired and then decided to come back to academia and then uh, become a professor. In that vein, I actually have a couple of books. The first book is actually on the philosophy of physics. So that is a, uh, called The Unreal Universe. And I called it a study in applied spirituality. But it's not really spirituality. It's more about spiritual philosophy and how that is reflected in uh, physics and, uh, and neuroscience and, uh, and uh, different branches of uh, human knowledge. That is that was the exploration there. Okay. Then I was hired to write a book called uh, Principles of Quantitative Development, which is a banking kind of book. But if you want to know more about me and my alliance of thinking, go and look up uh, the first book. Then on top of that, even though I'm approaching the grandfather age, I do keep an active life doing quite a bit of badminton, play quite well for my age, and uh, writing and blogging and philosophizing. So philosophizing is one of my uh, traits in my class, my classes. And uh, at times I might go off on a tangent and start talking about the philosophy behind uh, certain things that are happening or certain topics that I'm explaining in the class. So that might happen even today. All right. So that is my background. Moving on. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Singapore Management University, my home school. This is uh, a young university. It was established only in 2000, 20 years ago. It's a management university at the heart of the city. It's in uh, what you might call downtown Singapore, the heart of the city. Okay. In Singapore, we call it the CBD, Central Business District. We have about 10,000 students. So 80% of the students are undergraduates. And we have six different schools. It's a management university, it's a business school. So my home school is actually information systems, which is like a computer science department, but focus more on topics that are closer to business, which is why when I give this talk, I'll be talking about business and how the interplay between business and data analytics more than just data analytics proper. We have five other schools, accountancy, business, economics, law, and social sciences. All in all, we have about 350 faculty members across all six schools. We do produce some impressive research. In particular, in my school, there's a program called Master of IT in Business. That is ranked number one in Asia. 14th in the world. So it's this number one being number one in Asia is uh, extremely satisfying for us because number one in Asia, of course, means number one in Singapore also. And Singapore does have a couple of more established uh, universities and being able to beat them in this particular uh, program, we are extremely gratified. Okay, so this is something that we highlight again and again. So that is about the university, but nothing tells you more than showing you some pictures. So let me show you a couple of uh, pictures about the university. So that is one nice uh, uh, shot about that. This, I believe, is a school of accountancy, night shot. Okay. The campus really is quite beautiful, even though it is uh, right in the heart of the city. It's not, uh, not you know, uh, where you have a lot of space, but we've done an excellent job, or they have done an excellent job making it very beautiful and green. Okay. So this is our, our library and it's the library from a different angle at night, which looks very nice if you ask me. 
Then I wanted to show you some pictures of the students and their activities. I couldn't find any pictures on online. So I went to uh, prospectors and scanned a couple of pages. So our students are extremely active, not just in, uh, in uh, studies. Uh, they are a vibrant. They have a very vibrant student community. At times, I finish my uh, class late at night, uh, say 11 o'clock in the night. I am kind of so tired and dragging myself to my car walking through the basement. We have a basement connecting all different buildings of the school. And then you see all these students at 11 o'clock in the night dancing around and jumping around, these youngsters with so much energy. So it's a very vibrant uh, student community that we have. So the reason for telling you all these things is that if you guys are looking to uh, uh, send your kids somewhere, uh, do consider our university, all right? Now, the geography, like I said, it is downtown Singapore or the CBD Singapore. So this is what it looks like the things in the foreground that you see things in uh, amber like two three four those numbers in amber in yellow or orange those are the university buildings so my university my building is a uh, number three it says the gym because gym is actually in the basement of my building and back there you see the skyline of singapore the three things to the right uh, three uh, uh, pillars to the right top right corner of the the picture with that boat like structure on top of it that is the iconic marina bay sands building and then slightly to the left of it number nine would be a hotel uh this used to be called western stamford and that is where i actually got married uh, 25 years ago now okay so very close to all these activities and downtown in singapore so uh like i said right in the beginning this talk is not going to be a technical kind of talk it's not a research talk it's a high level talk so I'll talk about different aspects of data analytics, trying to answer questions like what, when, how, why, who, etc., etc. So that is my plan. So to set your expectations right, again, it's not a research or technical talk. If you have such talks, I'm sure you have such talks in the conference. But this is more of a big, big picture kind of talk. Okay. So this is not, I'm not a computer scientist, as you saw from my background. I was an engineer, but... I became a physicist, so I'm more into fundamental kind of uh, research. And right now I'm an educator. So I'm not a practicing computer science scientist. So it's not that kind of talk. Okay. So this talk will be most appropriate for people who are looking for a career in uh, business analytics or mid-level management or even entrepreneurs. Okay. So that is the, the layout. So let's start with the, the why question, the reasons behind data analytics. Okay. Why is it so popular? So I used to teach a course called uh, uh, Analytics Foundation a couple of years ago. That is like the first introductory course in data analytics. And in my first class, I used to say that uh, these skills that you learn in this course are practical and necessary skills for a business career. Okay. So digging a little deeper into that statement, in the last couple of decades, computer literacy was expected of you when you join a company to work in any capacity. So computer literacy means being able to use a computer, like uh, Office Suite, uh, Word, Excel, etc., or doing uh, web surfing, email. So basic things. Those things were expected of you, regardless of what it is you are doing uh, in a company, even if you are like a finance person or, or uh, human resources. These things you had to know. My expectation is that in, in the next couple of decades, analytic, analytics literacy is going to be something that is expected of you. That's going to be expected of you. So it's not just going to be Excel because that's too weak to do anything that is meaningful in the space of data analytics. Okay. So this is something that is going to happen. Just about a year and a half ago, year and a half ago, my university started offering specific bespoke uh, analytics courses from different schools. That is because they all, it's a business school, as I told you, they all realized that in their respective field, data analytics is going to exert a large amount of influence and they wanted to be uh, they wanted to keep that to within their school rather than give it to some other school spe specialized school like information systems so that is happening and that trend is going to continue maybe it is already there in the the workplace so maybe when you apply for a job now even if you're doing something that is uh, very unrelated to data analytics you might be called upon to do some level of data analytics kind of studies like uh, if you're in a in a retail business you might have to look at your customer database and maybe segment them into different uh, groups to drive some marketing campaign that would be a, cl a clustering kind of pro problem 
those things you might be expected to do rather than farm it out or outsource to a different uh, company. So that I think is going to happen. Okay. But why is this happening? What are the, the drivers behind this trend? So that is what I want to look at in the first part of this talk. Okay. So this is what I would call the changing data landscape. So let's look at the mega trends in the data landscape. The first thing is if you look at data landscape, not data specifically, but the whole uh, operation of uh, digital businesses, etc. What you will see is that data is being generated. The data volume is increasing and the variety, the variation, the kind of data that you get also is increasing. So that is the first trend. The second one is the consumption part. So uh, there is a generation part, which is the supply side of data. And there's a consumption part that is the, the consumption, uh, meaning it's the pull side of data, demand side of data. That also is uh, increasing in terms of, not just in terms of uh, the volume, but also in terms of expectations of speed, okay? And in that sense, data velocity, how fast you have to create an insight starting from the data you have, that also is, uh, is uh, uh, increasing. And underpinning all these things, supporting all these uh, changes are the technology evolutions in, uh, in uh, the space of data. So these are the different things that we will look at, okay? So there is a real veritable explosion of data that is happening, okay? Exponential growth in data volume in many fields, and it is expected to continue. There is no end in sight. Then there is uh, uh, demands on the data, the requirements coming out of customers and uh, business partners, on insights and uh, reporting requirements, uh, especially in banking, for instance, from uh, uh, regulatory bo bodies like uh, like uh, 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 Monetary Authority of Singapore, for instance. Okay, so even the customers are becoming more sophisticated in their demand of what it is that they're looking for in data. Okay, and the speed that is an interesting uh, concept: the velocity of data, how it moves from one platform, generation platform, to a, a consumption platform, which is the inside generation side, and how fast it has to be done. It is near real, it's a near real time these days, okay? Almost real time requirement, okay? So once it becomes that level of speed requirement, there's no way a human analyst can actually do this. You don't have enough time for somebody to collect the data, do some preparation and then run it, and then generate out, outputs look at the insights and then present it. That takes far too long. Even for a very experienced data scientist, it might take half an hour, but half an hour is not real time, okay? Real time is uh, when a car going on a highway decides to brake, okay? That is real time. And if, uh, if it is a data science engine that is dri driving that decision, that has to happen in real time, not at any, not with any kind of delay at all, okay? All right. So, System innovations, technology innovations, that also is something interesting to look at. So we'll look at that one also. Technology costs, as you know, there is this uh, famous Morse law, which says every 18 months, the amount of computing power that you can buy for say $1,000 is doubling every 18 months. And uh, so is uh, the, the data storage technology. Okay? And that really supports uh, big data, especially the requirement on data velocity and the size of the data, driving the big data. So this is the general outline of my next five minutes of uh, presentation. So let's look at the first one, which is data explosion. So where is the data coming from? As you might have, uh, as you know, certainly, but you may not have appreciated it all the time. You are always walking around with a sensor. Your smartphone is a sensor. It's got many different sensors. That is generating a lot of data, okay? So in addition to that, you might have an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, et cetera. That is for health monitoring, how many steps you took, etc. And also, you might have uh, logistic companies like UPS, um, FedEx. They also create a large amount of data automatically. In fact, if you think about it, any kind of interaction that you have with a smart smartphone, smartwatch, or a website is a touch point where data is being generated and stored. Okay, so that is a humongous amount of data coming from that. Then that is uh, from the end user perspective. But from the enterprise side also, from the business side, there are information systems generating transactional kind of data from a point of sales, for instance, and uh, a customer relations management, CRM kind of places, and call centers. Every support call that you make generates audio uh, track of your interaction, which might be transcribed to a text file, and then you can use that 
for quality control diagnostics etc interesting ideas there okay and then there are data providers okay so these would be if you are uh, in a legal field there are uh, speci specific uh, uh, providers and then also if you are in the ip space for instance lexus nexus and uh, credit rating equifax and then uh, agencies like bloomberg reuters all those people providing uh, finance finance kind of data index index data okay then there are statistical uh, bodies that uh, and regulators regulators that provide data uh, on a regular basis okay? and then though these are all interesting sources of data but then there's another source that is the web the the internet you can just go and uh, scrape data that is something that we do uh, as, as researchers all the time get data from the internet and then use it okay but the interesting thing is social media data is uh, growing exponentially and uh, uh, so you have networks like linkedin and facebook of course and then tweet tweets coming out of uh, the us president for instance okay a lot of data coming up and some more insidious kind of data from uh, browser history web logs or blogs okay those things also are there there was one uh, comedian that i was listening to about a year ago who said if you want to see somebody's uh, image as he wants to portray it to you as he wants to project to you you look at his uh, facebook page but if you want to know the real person you look at his browser history this is uh, bill bar who said it okay bill mar sorry not bill bar bill mar okay so so that is a scary thought if uh, your browser history is uh, for everybody to consume that might tell you a lot more than you would like the world to know okay then you have these huge uploads that are happening in uh, instagram and uh, tiktok and uh, youtube and whatnot so that also is a, a huge amount of data so to put some numbers behind all these claims and statements that i made in 2005 the size of the date the whole data space in the world that is the size of everything in the digital domain as data was 0.13 zettabyte zettabyte so i think it is a terabyte petabyte exabyte and uh, then zettabyte so it's like a, a four or five orders of magnitude bigger than a terabyte okay so that is 0.13 zettabyte for all the data in 2020 it was projected to be 44 zettabyte and if you sit down and do the the calculation the compounding rate of interest there date of growth rate of growth that is 47 percent yearly growth if you are still wondering how this is done you have to look up your uh, logarithm from uh, high school okay so but this is only the tip of the iceberg this is not not done yet the next big explosion in data will come from 5g when devices start talking to each other so you are not in the loop devices that uh, communicate with each other can create a tremendous amount of data kind of uh, scenarios that I'm foreseeing is uh, something like suppose you are in a traffic jam your car is a uh, uh, you are driving your car and there are three cars in front of you uh, and the fourth car in front of you sees something and decides to break and uh, but it's not the human the driver not deciding to break it's the ca car itself because of its intelligence decides to break and it might actually communicate that to all the cars behind so even before you real realize that there's something wrong the car might start breaking you might think that this is a kind of a science fiction kind of idea but it's not my last car not the current present car my last car was a volvo and that had this uh, uh, obstruction detection system so if i drive into a, a, a parking parking lot barrier the car would actually break by itself and stop that used to happen okay it was a very scary experience for the driver because it's doing something that you are not asking it to do anyway th those things are going to increase and that's is that in that context that i said if a car decides to do something uh, uh, it has to be real time it has to be the velocity requirement on the data analytics program running that decision would have to be real time it is not enough to say oh something is happening i'm going to make a decision but let me do garbage collection in before that that wouldn't work okay so that is uh, the the data supply side the explosion of data there is uh, there are real data lakes or data oceans these days okay the next one demand for data driven insights 
okay so let's look at that one so if you look at the places where it is actually being used you will see things like service improvements chevron that is a oil and gas exploration exploration kind of a company when they do drilling they have real-time feedback coming from the drill bits into the system to know how the drilling is going so that actually improves the performance uh, of that particular operation so it's not that only there disney hospitality sector they track customers and uh, they try to optimize the usage of their park in uh, in anaheim and uh, and uh, orlando you will see this kind of stuff also so look at the 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 range it is from oil and gas to hospitality so that is the the range of places where data driven insights are being demanded and provided and if you look at process improvements amazon as an e-commerce e provider of course they use uh, market basket analysis to to tell you or offer uh, highly specified highly customized and personalized uh, offerings to you okay walmart also in the retail sector they have consumer packaged goods uh, partners who actually get their data directly from uh, the system rather than through human beings so that they can optimize and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 optimize their supply chain okay so real time insights are being transmitted so again a huge range not just e-commerce but traditional retail shops also now if you look at uh, new kinds of products that are being offered this is an interesting uh, topic there is auto insurance as you i don't know how this is done in india but in uh, singapore and then all of the places i've been to if you are young you pay more insurance your insurance premium for car insurance is higher because you're likely to make an accident you're not experienced enough and also you're young and foolish so you might uh, go mad maxing in the city and uh, cause an accident so so if i pay very little in terms of car insurance because i've been driving for driving forever but my son is going to start driving maybe next year obviously if he needs to get a car insurance it will be very high because he's a new new young man that is the worst risk category that there is now there is this uh, company that came up with uh, an idea that uh, they would like to place a device on your car that will capture your driving characteristics so if you're uh, accelerating and speeding and stopping too fast or uh, taking the corners too sharply the device will know and will transmit that information to the auto insurance but for uh, placing this device in your car you will get a discount and if your driving habits are good then you will get a discount also so that is a real time kind of pricing of insurance so this is one of the places where i feel like talking about the philosophy of uh, insurance a little bit what is insurance insurance is the idea that you take risk from different uh, different people different sources you pool risk together and then price it equally for everybody so that uh, the the price can be met by everybody for instance if you have different people you're taking health insurance they give you a certain premium and they know that that premium is enough to cover the expenditure for the whole group but for any one person he might you know i might get cancer or something very serious and my expenses might be very high but that's okay because i am being subsidized by some other people who manage to stay healthy so that is insurance so same thing applies here auto in auto insurance also but if you are changing that and if you are cha actually cha charging people more based on their risky behavior then that philosophical idea behind insurance is actually being damaged or diminished a little bit in the limit if the device is actually able to predict the risk absolutely exactly precisely then what's going to happen then it's almost like having no insurance right my son will pay exactly the amount he will incur that year and i will pay close to nothing because i incurred nothing so that is that is no insurance at all so the whole meaning of the the philosophical meaning of insurance is being changed by some of these ideas okay that is the end of my philosophical rant there moving on netflix and other streaming services like uh, apple tv plus and uh, amazon prime or whatever they can use and are using their past history to optimize the investment in the in their content creation efforts okay now in uh, the health insurance space also there is a company called humana that uh, takes your data and provides predictive kind of an analytics on it so that your actual expenditure 
in uh, in health insurance is actually lower so it's actually an added benefit for the insurance company for instance it might uh, actually this is an idea that i started a company to do with a couple of friends just before i became a professor so after i became a professor i gave up on that one uh, the idea is that you take the body based measurements things like uh, things that uh, your smartphone or apple watch or fitbit can give you also you take uh, uh, your family history your medical history etc and based on all that and based on some changes in your uh, biological uh, indicators maybe the program can predict that okay you are getting dangerously dangerously close to an to to a heart attack or a, a diabetes problem then you should go and see a doctor so hope is that this can happen a week or a few days before the actual event happens making it a lot more uh, financially viable see once you have a heart attack it's very difficult to uh, very expensive to treat you not difficult but expensive but if if you can catch you before that that makes it a lot more uh, cost effective prevention is always much more cost effective than uh, than a curative kind of treatment so that was the, that's the idea behind human that was the idea behind our thing also but for a variety of reasons it it did not really take off one thing is that it's a highly uh, regulated kind of uh, uh, space so you cannot come up with uh, uh, health care kind of predictions in singapore and make statements like you're going to have a heart attack go see a doctor and if you don't have a heart attack that is a big liability issue for the company anyway so that is uh, that but look at uh, the range again nike which is a sports apparel kind of company they are also getting into the space of actually monitoring your health and providing user feedback humana an insurance company and uh, an apparel company so that's this is the the merging of different fields of uh, of businesses where data analytics is actually cutting through everything okay so service improvements process improvements new kind of process offerings and new business models also revenue models so that is that then that is one aspect of uh, data so we talked about uh, the supply side where the data is coming from and the demand side how the data is being used for what purpose then let's look at how soon people expect the results so the insights generated from the data so there is this uh, uh, there are these uh, map kind of applications like uh, waze and google map i'm pretty sure you guys might have used it and uh, singapore traffic is pretty good but i go to jakarta quite often for personal reasons and the place where i stay is about uh, an hour and a half or so from the airport and traffic is pretty bad usually and i use uh, uh, google maps to kind of monitor where the traffic jams will happen and how long it's going to take etc and it's very interesting i it got me thinking how does uh, google know or google maps know that uh, the traffic jam is in a particular segment of the highway so i thought about it is it like they have satellites monitoring the highway or they're taking feeds from uh, from uh, humans or, or, or cameras no it's not that it's actually every user of google maps is also a data provider when i'm using google maps i have my gps on of course and it i am providing data on my speed and uh, position to google so that google knows if i slow down it's probably because of a traffic jam so a data purveyor a data consumer is also a provider of data that is quite interesting okay then there is uh, another thing that is automatically monitoring uh, your usage patterns knowing your usage patterns and knowing the levels of uh, the amenities that you have for instance if you have if you're running out of uh, uh, what is that uh, 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 t- uh, laundry detergent or toilet uh, paper or a kitchen towel etc this little device from amazon can actually figure out that this is happening and then from your use your consumption pattern it knows how much you will need and in the us it will actually m- place the order by itself without you having to intervene and in the us the delivery time is 2 hours so by the time you get home from work if you're running out of milk milk will be at your doorsteps so this is quite interesting the only thing that will happen is that the money will be taken out of your, of your credit card without your ever authorizing it i would think so that is uh, an idea that uh, that is being deployed in the us another thing is uh, uh, something that we touched upon real time pricing we talked about uh, uh uh the uh what is that progressive the auto insurance uh, pricing which is responsive to your risk 
your risk uh, taking patterns but if you're taking airline uh, uh, if you're flying somewhere the price that you pay will be very different from the price of the the guy next to you sitting next to you paid why is that because depending on the 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 purchase cycle the time at which you bought the ticket you might get different prices depending on how the demand is changing etc so if you try to buy a ticket now it's going to be probably cheaper maybe because of covid but the real time kind of a pricing again requiring uh, an immediate response real time response okay dynamic pricing also netflix when you're watching something is analyzing your uh, behavior so that it can offer you more appropriate things for you to watch so that you stay in front of the tv and uh, keep watching netflix all right and again in logistics in uh, amazon they have another arm called uh, amazon robotics uh, trying to do to optimize uh, how uh, the orders are being fulfilled okay as you can see amazon is quite big in this data space clearly because they create, generate a large amount of data or rather we generate a large amount of data for amazon whenever we go to their website and do anything with them all right so that was the the velocity requirements on data the requirements are getting uh, more stringent in terms of uh, speed so that's the point i was uh, trying to make there the next one is about the technology evolutions that are kind of uh, 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 supporting or underpinning these these uh, changes so storage of course is getting cheaper than ever okay so in 2009 one terabyte cost about 9.3 uh uh thousand uh, dollars 9300 dollars and in 2015 that was about two thousand dollars okay so there is a drop there all right so if you look at uh, these two numbers and again if you do this logarithm kind of calculation you will see that year on year uh, drop in price is something like 23 percent okay but remember that supply side data is being supplied or the supply is, is increasing at a rate of 47 percent all right so this drop is probably not fast enough but that is the hardware side but on the on the software side in order to actually manage these uh these uh, uh, uh innovations and uh, changes in the data landscape you have distributed file systems like hadoop again this is to handle big data the definition of big data is that it's too big for one computer to hold it in the memory and process it so distributed file system is indicated and uh, then you have to have mechanisms of uh, aggregating the results and uh, and uh, worry about data synchronization etc so that is uh, all done by hadoop okay then there are real time architectures like kafka and elastic search i don't really know much about those things but i presume it is something similar to uh, hadoop and then you have solutions that are deployed uh, on the cloud so that you don't have to actually do this uh, on your computer actually our students they do use amazon web services to do data analytics kind of projects okay so i don't know if you guys do it uh, in your college too but we do okay and supporting all these things are free and open source uh, software like python spark and uh, r so these are the the evolutions that are happening on the technology side supporting all these things all right I feel as though I'm going a little slower than I wanted to. So let's just look at the the data evolution over the years. When I started my career, uh, uh, academic career, anything to do with data, we used to have small tables of data, megabytes of data maybe, and they were in text files or maybe CSV files, etc. Et and we used to run batch jobs. So you deploy a job and then come back after three or four hours and then get the results. That was a mode of mode of uh, operation at that time then by the time i reached uh, banks then there used to be periodic kind of jobs running on giga gigabytes or terabytes of data running off databases okay then in the next phase the data volume became terabytes to petabytes and the data became images and audio and uh, web etc and the requirements t turned out to be near real-time kind of requirement if you upload a video or uh, on Facebook, you don't want to wait for two days before it becomes active. You want it to come alive as soon as possible. Maybe you don't mind five minutes. Maybe you don't mind ten minutes. But beyond that, it becomes uh, becomes uh, troublesome. All right. Then, with the explosion of video kind of uh, social media like uh, 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 YouTube and uh, and TikTok and whatnot, 
coming out of uh, mobile uh, platforms, the requirements are even more stringent in terms of time and the, the volume is in exabytes. Okay, And the next phase of it is going to be 5G, ultra low latency kind of uh, networks and in Internet of Things where data will be generated by device to device interactions without a human being in the loop. And it's going to be massive device to device data lakes or data oceans, I should say. They are going to be in in zettabytes, okay, zettabytes. So that is the volume increasing in red over there on my uh, right hand side quadrant. And then the speed increasing, you know, from uh, batch jobs a few hours to uh, real time. And also the variety of data from textual numbers and textual kind of data to uh, to video and what else, who, who knows what is going to be in the next phase. So this is the context in which de the big data is actually becoming more and more relevant. The massive device to device or human generated data running into zettabytes or huge large number of exabytes, which you cannot handle on one computer. So we talked about the why, the reasons behind our data analytics. Let's talk a little bit about what it is from a business perspective again. What you have when you have data is huge volume that we saw when we talked about uh, big data is huge volume. Huge volume means the density of information, the density of uh, knowledge is actually low. As you know, density from physics, you know, it's a weight divided by or mass divided by volume and the volume is large, the density is low. So the idea behind data analytics is to distill this information or distill data so that you get, you increase the density of information. Okay, so you increase the density of information. You go up the, the value pyramid as it were. So when you're dealing with data, you need a database uh, uh, specialist. What is it called? Database operator, is it? Yeah. The requirement from the the domain expert expertise is uh, uh, from the technical side is high, but from the business side, business knowledge is not really required at that stage. You have the data, you mess with the data, you store it, retrieve it, you do something. So that is the level at which you are working. But when you do a little bit of uh, processing on it, you get information, high level of uh, knowledge, and it becomes more usable for the business. And you do even more uh, data analytics on it, it becomes insights. So it's not just data anymore. It is going away from the, the technical domain and it's becoming more of a business domain uh, focus. And uh, that will be things that uh, business people may be able to understand. And even at a higher level, <clears throat> when you work on it for long enough, it actually becomes, becomes a very low volume, high density action points. Those are actually uh, recommendations okay that can come out of data analytics so that is the highest density of information and that leads to actions that is the value of data so in the beginning you have huge amount and the low density in the end you have practically infinite density because at that point it's not data anymore it is an action that is being taken from the business perspective uh, expertise in technical domain is uh, not needed at that point but the business knowledge is paramount, critical at that point. So based on that, let's look at uh, the skill set needed for a data scientist. Data scientist, I understand that this is a, an engineering school that I'm talking to. So we tend to think of uh, real knowledge being technical knowledge. When I was in IIT, that's the way I thought also. We had to do some economics course. I was so angry, wasting my time doing something that is so soft and amorphous no use at all. I wanted to do more hardcore technical kind of stuff. But once you get out of the engineering school and then start looking at the world, you will realize that it is not the technical expertise that is uh, always called for. There, You should have this, the expertise to bridge things from that domain, the technical domain, to the real world also. So of course, math and uh, numerical skills are necessary you know, for a data analyst, data analytics, analyst, or a data scientist, statistics, maybe uh, tools like Excel or Python, etc., large data sets, and exposure to data mining te techniques. All those things are important. I'm not minimizing those things. But at the same time, you should aim to have the business domain knowledge and the ability to look for the right kind of tools for the right type of solution. This is critical. This is important because otherwise, whatever you do may not actually match with the problem that you're trying to solve or you may not even understand what the problem is you get data 
you do something interesting, you get something out, but that may not be relevant to the business at all. So that part is important. So we'll I'll come back to that point a couple of times to harp on it. Well, harping on it for the first time here, communication skills to present your technical solution as a simple and uh, actionable business solution is important and it's even critical. So the points in red, the last two points, that is something that I would highlight over and over again. The thing is, even if you are technically very good, if you don't have these two skills, you will find your career standard in the future. You will be in some organization and you will be just doing kind of menial kind of data analytic stuff without ever having the exposure or the impact that you kind of deserve because of your expertise. All right. So let's look at uh, the different uh, skill sets that I talked about. Communication skills are important, critical, paramount, crucial. But if you have only communication skills and nothing else, you're just a talker. You're just hot air. Nothing else is there. Add to that uh, some knowledge of statistics. If you have only statistics, then you're a data kind of person, a nerd, basically just happy with numbers. But if you have communication skills along with some knowledge of mathematics behind it, then you become a stats professor. Not totally unlike myself, I would think. Okay. Add to that some programming skills also. If you're good only in programming, you're not really valuable. You're a hacker, but you're not really that valuable to a business. But add statistics to it, to it then you become, uh, you know, part of an R or, or data analytics core team. And add communication skills to it, then you become a consultant. Then you are beginning, beginning to make big bucks. Okay. And programming and communication will be computer science professor. Again, not unlike myself. I do teach a com computer science course called Linear Algebra for Computers computing applications, math course, actually. Finally, if you add business, that's when things actually start to take off. If you have only business knowledge and nothing else, then you're just like a, an accountant, okay? Business knowledge and programming, then you are an IT guy. And if you have business knowledge, programming, and knowledge of statistics, then you can do, uh, you can be something like a data scientist, maybe not quite there, but almost there, okay? All right, so at the intersection of everything, right at the center, is what you have as an ideal perfect data scientist okay so you need communication skills statistics math skills programming and business knowledge right in this talk we are kind of de-emphasizing uh, probably the programming part maybe even statistics to a certain degree we'll touch upon it but not too much right so the business analyst uh, skills will be communication statistics and uh, business of course and that is probably those are probably the people who will drive most benefit out of this talk okay not totally technical kind of people and i'll be highlighting over and over again that that skill set you know communication and business knowledge those skill sets are crucial so there is this paradigm that i saw somewhere called badder is an approach uh, for data science kind of projects starting from a business question coming all the way up to a business recommendation or an action point this is what we saw as a as a pyramid earlier so you start from a business question and then you plan your analysis and based on that plan you collect your data and you derive insights and then you come up with recommendations so this is the whole value chain do you can you kind of figure out where data analytics sits in this value chain it sits between two numbers one two three four five six between two of those numbers can you tell me where it is let me look at uh, my three and four excellent yeah that is absolutely right okay so data science is something that data analytics is something that is actually in between those two things once you have the data you want to derive technical kind of insights out of it that is where data science or data analytics comes in all right so you can see it's only a small part of this whole chain of uh, or the flow chart of uh, of the project all right but even that small part is actually not just one thing it's the the data science project, how it runs. You start with what we call EDA, exploratory data analysis, and then data preparation, then model development, and lastly, interpretation of the insights. Again, where the actual algorithms and programming happens, that would be in the third box, model development. That is the so-called sexy part of, uh, of data science, but that's not all of it. If you actually do a real project, you will understand, you realize and appreciate that uh, it takes about 80% of the time to run the EDA and data preparation part. Maybe 15% of the time doing the model development actual running of it. 
maybe 5 to 10% of the time interpreting the results and creating the business value out of it. Okay? So again, what you might think of it as a technical skill has only a very small role to play in the whole chain. All right, no need to pause now because that was quick. All right, so we talked about uh, the why, the reasons behind data analytics, its uh, prominence these days. Then we talked about how it is done a little bit or what it is really. Now, let me talk about the tools. So here, data analytics can be divided into different categories based on uh, method and purpose. I presume all of you know this. You could have descriptive analytics, which is like dashboard. It's like telling the business uh, user what's going on in the business. It's the status monitoring kind of thing. Then you can have predictive analytics, which would be like what is likely to happen in the future based on what happened in the past. And then you can have prescriptive analytics, which is more like if you want a certain outcome, what is it that you need to change? How do you influence the, uh, the, the future? So the first one is just the present. The second one is uh, predicting the future based on the past. And the third one, prescriptive analytics, is about using analytics tools to influence or make the future what you want it to be. So obviously that is the one that has the highest value. So this is not a technical kind of classification. This is based on the method and purpose of the project that you're working on. But from a technical side, you have unsupervised and supervised tools. Okay, I'm actually talking uh, more in terms of the actual algorithms now, not really going into the mathematics, but at least telling you what they are. Okay, so unsupervised tools or algorithms are about finding or discovering uh, patterns. So you have data, you don't know anything about the data, and you're asking the computer or your program, are there any patterns that I should look at? That would be pattern discovery, okay? Unsupervised means nobody has looked at the data, there are no labels to different data points, and or no annotations or comments, or no labels really, okay? So if you have, if you're working with a retail shop and you have say 1,000 customers, and they want to run a, a marketing campaign, but only for their high-end customers, maybe a hundred of them, or they want to run three or four different kinds of campaigns depending on their spending pattern, then you would be trying to cluster customers into different groups. Okay, So that would be a clustering uh, kind of analysis where you have the data, but you don't really know what patterns exist within the data. Another thing is a market basket analysis for upselling. Okay? The second one is supervised algorithm where you have the data and you already know the patterns, but can computer learn to use those patterns? That is the idea. So this is about pattern recognition or learning. So supervised basically means you have data and along with, the, with that, you have some labels. Somebody has actually looked at the data and said, okay, this data means that, all right? For instance, if you're in a bank, if you're doing a, a loan approval, people have done that for ages. So you have data of the customer and then there's a flag that says, okay, approved or rejected. So those are the labels. And use, using that, if you have, uh, say, 10,000 of such records, you can probably use that to predict the next one without actually going through the process of verifying each one of the points. Okay, That would be learning the pattern, when to say yes, when to say no. That would be pattern, pattern uh, recognition. So face recognition is a classic example of that. Classification, decision support, all those things are things like that. Regression when used for prediction also is a is a is a supervised uh, learning algorithm. Supervised algorithm, I shouldn't say learning algorithm. It's a supervised algorithm. All right, so let's look at these things uh, in a little bit more detail. So you have uh, this example of uh, unsupervised algorithm, which is uh, customer segmentation. Okay. Now let's say we don't really want to do customer segmentation on, in this talk. Let's say you have images of a bunch of animals and you give these images to the computer. So you have, uh, and you tell the computer that there are two kinds of animals, right? Without any further help, the computer may be able to cluster them into two groups fairly accurately. If you think about it, if you actually give these uh, pictures of two animals to a kid, uh, a four-year-old or a five-year-old, who hasn't actually seen either of the animals, but uh, and uh, if you tell the, the kid that, okay, there are two kinds of animals here, put these pictures in two different groups based on what animal it is, and I'm pretty sure most kids will be able to do that. Okay, that's discovering a pattern and uh, and uh, doing the clustering, okay? This is an unsupervised uh, learning. So the keywords that you have to remember if you're using this, is things like segmentation, clustering, etc., or grouping. And the technical keywords would be k-means or hierarchical clustering algorithms. So if you hear those things, as a non-technical management kind of person, you might 
want to know that okay there's an unsupervised uh, method that people are using and here I don't have labels but I might be able to still use the data all right so grouping customers uncovering hidden pat patterns etc that's where this will be used okay so let me take two animals here a tiger there a horse there another tiger there another tiger there some horses the tiger and give all these uh, pictures to a computer and ask computers to group uh, these eight pictures into two groups the computer will be able to do this or should be able to do it well maybe not if they are pictures but if they are uh, data points a computer will definitely be able to do it if it is k-means algorithm for instance it will be able to find a separator which is like a, a perpendicular bisector between these two sets of data in some space all right and, send, and two groups okay so this is a clustering kind of a problem okay you don't have any labels you just have photos and you just want to create groups so this was a very easy thing it's a very easy thing for a human being to do and it's not very difficult for a computer to do either so i first gave this uh, talk to uh, uh, a bunch of uh, managers or uh, vice presidents from uh, a, a regional bank so that's why i have banking example here so i'm going to skip over the, the banking example because that's not very interesting for you guys all right so that is a uh, one kind of a uh, unsupervised learning algorithm another one is uh, about market basket analysis so if you go to amazon and if you buy uh, one book so this uh, book uh, by uh, david nichols called one day if you buy that which i actually did uh, i really like this uh, this author if you haven't read him i would highly recommend his uh, books because i believe you know uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years from now if there is one author that will be remembered as uh, one of the classics of classic authors of uh, early 21st century i think it's going to be this guy so david nichols all right so when you buy one of his books uh, amazon is going to come back and uh, give you a bunch of uh, uh, suggestions so you, here if you look at it it is david nichols again us by david nichols then starter for 10 by david nichols the understudy by david nichols all those books in fact i have read all of them or fiction nothing nothing very fancy just fiction but very nice ones all right so that is what uh, amazon is doing why is it doing that because it knows that if you bought one of these books if you know that somebody else bought this book some bought the other book also you're likely to probably buy it this is kind of a cross-selling something else so there is a this some people might find this idea of cross-selling or even upselling a bit uh, what shall i say a bit of cheating i actually felt that way some time ago when i was with the bank i used to have lunch around uh, the central business district a place called Bodki, if you are familiar with singapore where you have a lot of lunch places so once my wife came over to have lunch with me so i took her to this uh, restaurant in uh, Bodki. so as i was walking in as i was looking for restaurants i saw that this place had a uh, two for one deal so two lunches for the price of one me being a little thrifty i thought okay that's an excellent deal let's go in and find out so i went in there it was like ten dollars per person individually but if it is a two for one it's going to be only ten dollars for two that is an excellent deal actually for for uh, that part of the city so i said okay we'll go for it and then since i got a good deal i thought okay, i would have another glass of wine maybe another ten dollars and then they came and asked my wife what would you like to drink she was going to drive so she didn't want to drink wine so people when they get that question what do you want to drink they don't typically look at the menu they would just answer something like ice lemon tea or uh, 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 sweet lime or lemon juice so that's the typical answer so she said one of those things i think it was a uh, uh, lemonade she asked for a lemonade so when the bill came i was surprised because my estimate was okay ten dollars for the lunch ten for the wine twenty dollars maybe two dollars for the lemonade twenty two dollars uh, etc etc everything put together maybe twenty five dollars twenty six dollars tax and all that but the the whole thing was close to forty bucks and i was kind of surprised so i look at the the thing and then i saw that the lemonade was actually 13 dollars it is 30.99 14 dollars so how did they know that people are likely to buy lemonade if they bought the other stuff or if they walked into the restaurant at all so they were actually cheating a little bit because nobody expects the lemonade to be 14 dollars they expect it to be two dollars but we ended up paying 14 dollars and they made their money even after they gave me the the discount so anyway that is the nefarious part of a, of a market basket analysis okay so so this uh, little cartoon that says if you bought bananas you're also likely to buy carrots and uh, potatoes and whatnot so that is uh, making fun of amazon okay so that is market basket analysis okay. anyway trudging along then let's move on to supervised algorithms okay let's talk about classification what 
I might have in that case is a bunch of photos and the corresponding labels. So I'm telling the computer that this photo is a tiger, this one a photo of horses, the next one is a tiger, that one is a tiger and that is a horse and that's another horse. So I have the data over there and the labels. So that is the annotation or the label. So I'm giving computer this information and expecting the computer to learn it and use it for some other new photo that it hasn't seen before. So I teach the computer, I run the algorithm, train it, it's called training. And then I give a new photo and ask the computer, what is this? The computer is likely to come, come back and tell me that it's a tiger. It's fairly obvious. So that also is come, come back and tell me that it is a, it is a horse. But what if I give uh, the computer that photo? In all likelihood, if computer is not intelligent, it just knows that, okay, the world contains only two kinds of animals, tigers and horses. And this looks more like a tiger than a horse. So it'll probably come back and tell me that it's a horse. Obviously, for us, we can take a look at it and say that it's not a horse, but computer doesn't have that, that contextual information. A donkey looks closer to a, a horse than a tiger. Okay. So, of course, your training data set has to be complete and the labels have to be complete. And in that case, you can actually expect the, the, the algorithm to perform well. Okay. My colleague in this uh, training course, he used to tell me this uh, idea of GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. If your data is garbage, your output is going to be garbage too. All right. So some of the possible applications, mostly from a business, uh, from a banking perspective, uh, loan approval. Right now it is done by uh, loan up is done by internal metrics like cash flows and assets and liabilities or it can be done by external metrics like credit rating and the classification is yes and no so that is the way it is done but it can probably be because you have done it for thousands and thousands of people you have the data and the corresponding labels you can let a computer learn it another one is a counterparty credit uh, risk management this is a more technical thing that happens in a bank when a bank wants to deal with another bank it wants to know how much exposure it wants to have against the other bank. That is managed used, uh, uh, using uh, either limits, credit limits for the, the, the counterparty or using the, the counterparty credit uh, rating coming from rating, rating agencies like Moody's, uh, etc. So that can probably also turn into something like a classification algorithm because again, because you have the data with the labels and the new data point is coming in you just run it run the algorithm it will be a lot faster and probably very very accurate so those are things that can be done it probably is not being done yet because they're worried about the the explanatory power the how much of the decision can you can explain and that is a, a weak point of uh, some of these uh, supervised learning algorithms anyway that is a technical point remember my uh, uh, colleagues uh, motto gigo garbage in garbage out models are only as good as the training data okay so classifications may not be accurate unless your training data is uh, is clean and that is why the exploratory data analysis eda is very important data preparation is very important okay now the next one i want to talk about is uh, another kind of uh, supervised learning which is a prediction of values rather than classes uh, in the last example, we had tigers and horses, so two classes of animals, either tiger class or the horse class. But what if it is not a class but a number like a stock market in index or something like that? Okay, so that is uh, uh, predictive and analytics. So this is a linear regression that I'm talking about, or auto regression. Okay, so that is can be used for something like uh, the turnover of a company next year based on the last five years, how it is growing. That will probably predict what it is going to have what's going to happen next year that would be a straightforward linear regression analysis but if the revenue depends on more than one uh, input not just the previous uh, inputs but also maybe the stock market index or the 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 house price index etc etc then you might be able to get more accurate predictions using multiple linear regression okay more than one um, one input uh, variable Okay, so it's not just limited to time series data. It can also be like predicting the, the, the price of a used car using things like uh, its mileage, the, the price of the corresponding model as a new car, etc. All right, so this, uh, some data that I collected from my students to illustrate this point and uh, showed it to them. 
I want to actually spend a minute on this one to kind of illustrate two points. So this is the data of uh, weight on the y-axis, okay, weight on the y-axis and the height in on the x-axis. So height in centimeter, weight in uh, kilograms. So you can see if you look at it, there is some correlation. Taller people tend to be heavier because they are taller. So there is some correlation. So there is something like a linear uh, line there that can be used to predict if I get a new guy and his height is a uh, 190 centimeters what's his most likely weight is going to be here 79 okay so that's that uh can you see anything else from this uh, data set in particular can you see kind of two groups here do you see a group here and another group here just in case you don't see my mouse let me say do you see a group with height around 160 and weight around say 55 and another one with height around say 178 77 and weight around 70, two clusters. If you actually run k-means clustering on this one, and with a, a, a k of two, two clusters, you will get a nice clusters. Do you see? Actually, the two groups are because one group is uh, girls, other group is boys. Boys tend to be taller and heavier, girls tend to be shorter and lighter. So those are the two groups, okay? So that's what I wanted to highlight. But there is a general trend, which is a linear trend. And there is one point I want to kind of highlight here. If you can see at 170 centimeter height, 80 kilos, that is somebody who is like an outlier. Well, it turns out that that was actually me. At that point, I was 80 kilos and these were young students. They're all thin and fit. I was a bit of an outlier, short and a uh, little heavy. Anyway, moving on. So we learned this. We looked at machine learning algorithms at a very high level. I said that there were two kinds unsupervised and supervised. Unsupervised could be class divided into, categorized into clustering kind of algorithms. And uh, I mentioned two algorithms, k-means and hierarchical. And then they could be about associations uh, like market basket analysis. That is how one item in the, the basket is related to some other item, okay? Then supervised could be classification. That's where you had the tigers and horses or regression where you had the height and weight. So if a new guy comes with an comes with a new height, I can kind of guess what his weight is going to be using the algorithm, okay? Then there is a linear algorithm, there's autoregression, there's linear regression and autoregression. And there are many other kinds of regressions also. There is a, a regression that is being used as a classification tool called a logistic regression and multiple linear regression when you have more than one input. And you can have a polynomial regression when the dependence is not really a line, but it is actually some other curve, a polynomial. Okay, this I'm going to kind of gloss over because uh, we are at the end of the, the the talk in terms of time. I mentioned right in the beginning that the biggest of big data in terms of the information density is actually text. Okay, so if you look at it, text can be used to do a lot of very interesting high quality information uh, processing. Okay, you can ask, uh, answer business questions and it can do sentiment analysis to see, especially on, on Twitter or on Facebook, what other people think about you because brands do live on, uh, on, uh, on the web these days, okay? Can get, can generate structured data. You can do topic discovery, all right? Where do you get uh, text and what do you do with the text, okay? So the idea is to derive high quality information from text, okay? So this is also the text mining. It's fairly old in terms of, uh, uh, of a branch of computer science, okay? Idea is that you take text and you convert that into some kind of mathematical entity like a vector, and then those are those will be just numbers, and then all of the tools that you learned in data analytics or machine learning will apply to those tools, and then you can interpret, interpret it. So if you look at this Gangnam uh, uh, song and how it affected, you get a big paragraph like this, but you can ask the computer to create a concise summary, using a text analytics program and it will be able to do it and it will be fairly accurate. It's much easier to read that amber text rather than this white text, okay? Another thing is you have text with information about Facebook and Twitter. You want to create tables out of it. There are programs that will be able to do it, structured tables, okay? And I told you that SMU had uh, six schools, but if you go to Wikipedia, try to find the answer, it's kind of difficult to go through the whole thing and uh, get the answer. But if you just ask uh, Google, it'll probably look at it and find the answer and it'll tell you that SME has six schools, right? Exact answers, all right? Then sentiment analysis. 
again, if you have a large number of, if you are a restaurant and if you have a large number of re reviews, you want to know roughly what people think of your res restaurant. And then that would be a sentiment analysis and uh, sentiments and opinions. Why is it hard? Because language is very difficult for computers to understand because the meaning is not immutable. Meanings are not static. So suppose I say something like he has an apple. That could mean that she has an orange and he has an apple, or it could mean that she has a PZ and he has an apple. We understand it in the, based on the context. Computer doesn't have a context. Okay. And if I say some boy Sammy ate cookies on the floor, it mean might mean that Sammy picked up cookies from the floor and ate it, or it could mean that Sammy sat on the floor and uh, ate the cookies. So who is on the floor? Okay. What's on the floor or who is on the floor? Cookies or Sammy? So there are different kinds of ambiguities coming out of it. I, am, I know all these things because I'm actually teaching a text analytics course next term and I'm actually learning it right now. So it's all very fresh in my mind now. All right. Then there is a, there are these dialectic dialect problems. You know, UK has one dialect and the US has a different dialect and that creates a problem. And then because of uh, synonyms and uh, synonym like sentences, you have these two sentences mean the same thing, but to a computer, they have no similarity at all. There are no, well, there's only one word that is in common. Okay. So if you look at these two also, meaning the same thing, but very different sentences. All right. So text summarization is a, is an application or a task. Information retrieval from unstructured data to structured data. Question answering, sentiment analysis, and topic modeling. These are the different uh, things that you can do with text analytics. All right. Why are we doing it? Because large amount of textual data is being generated online, social media, especially uh, Twitter. Okay. And complaints actually happen or are logged first on the social media before they come and talk to you. They might start complaining on Instagram. Okay. And other people's opinions and uh, reviews do affect uh, your bottom line, the business's bottom line. Brands do live on, uh, on the internet these days. So now it's time to wrap it up. We talked about uh, the mega trends in the data landscape. What are the things that are, how things are changing, where the data is coming from the supply side, how the data is being used on the demand side, and the velocity requirements, how fast people ask for uh, insights, okay? And supporting the hardware, supporting structure of hardware and software. Then we moved on to, to big data, just a high level, two sentence summary of what big data really was, okay? And then we talked about data analytics. It's about automated generation of real-time insights. That is the, the key point of data analytics. Data analysis, as I used to do for my PhD, for instance, you just get the data, you write the program, you analyze it, you look at the output and make uh, judgments about the output. But here, you don't have time to do all those things. You do all these things once, you deploy it, and then you expect the computer to run it automatically and keep generating insights, and maybe even taking actions based on the insights. So the real thing, the real highlight of this uh, talk is the, the reason why you should focus not merely on your uh, technical skills but also on your communication skills my school being a business school my students are actually extremely good in presentation skills and talking etc etc and they will do well in their corporate careers or business careers because they have the communication skills and enough uh, technical outlook to shine so this is important. You, uh, I feel a little sad for my uh, fellow um, engineers from India and from China where their communication skills are not very good. Do not ignore the communication skills. Pay attention to it and uh, work on it so that you are not standard in your career path. Your progression is not standard. Okay, And that, that will uh, come back to help you later in life. Any comments? If not, let me just thank you all for uh, listening to me and uh, I enjoy the rest of the week and the rest of the conference and have a good weekend. You're very welcome. I enjoyed talking to you all. One point I want to make is that there are two branches. One is actually the application side of data analytics. The other side is uh, the research, research side. When you go into the research, you do have to be technically sound. You do have to get into the nitty gritty of the mathematics and algorithms. That is, of course, true. That is only one aspect. But the other aspect, which is much bigger and much more re relevant, both from the money-making perspective, the, the business impact and the impact in the world, that would be the application side. And that you should not ignore. That was my message to the students if the students are listening.